Good morning, all. My name is Phoebe Murrell. I'm a senior at Virginia Wesleyan University. Today, I'll be talking about stormwater pond algae as a bioremediator and as a vermicompost feedstock. One issue that often follows stormwater ponds is an influx of toxic heavy metals and pollutants. These ponds are often installed to capture and hold runoff from developed areas. Um, and while their function is primarily filtering runoff, their aesthetic value is also important in many areas um, like neighborhoods and college campuses, et cetera. Um, because of this, the naturally occurring algae that grows in them is generally considered a nuisance and typical control methods are not usually environmentally friendly. This begs the question then, how else can these ponds be managed? Um, one solution is to take advantage of that nuisance algae and use it for phycoremediation, which is the use of algae to remove pollutants from water. Um, algae uses excess nutrients in photosynthesis, and it also has a great potential to absorb heavy metals to it. Um, so when it's harvested from the water, the algae is nutrient dense and the water left behind has an enhanced quality. So our idea then was to take the algae that would otherwise, otherwise just be a waste product of phycoremediation and use it as a uh, feedstock for vermicompost. Um, and vermicompost is generally superior to traditional composting. It's more nutrient dense. It is a faster process and it's also convenient for someone to do just in their backyard. So um, if this project was successful, then algae could be used to produce a valuable and environmentally friendly uh, product, which is vermicompost. In order to evaluate the viability of this idea, uh, we conducted two series of studies. So the first was a mesoprism study um, to evaluate the nutrient and metal uptake of the algae. And then we conducted two series of compost studies to evaluate the success of algae as a feedstock for the worms, the vermicompost, and also the quality of the resulting compost. First was the mesochasm study, um, and I'll point out here that this series was conducted by students and faculty um, in the semester before I began my contribution, um, but they began by harvesting algae from various stormwater ponds on campus, um, and they set up 18 of these big blue, roughly 440 gallon tanks that were then filled with water from Lake Taylor um, and a thin layer of lake sediment at the bottom. Nine of the tanks were given um, an equal amount of algae from that that had been harvested. And of each type, algae or no algae, three tanks were spiked with a known amount of nutrients, three were spiked with metals, and three were not spiked at all. Um, the trial was allowed to run for 12 days and samples were taken every three days for analysis. Um, the results here were as expected after having reviewed the, li the literature. Um, the metal spiked tanks that had algae in them had a notably lower concentration of all five of the metals that we tested for um, by the end of the experiment. And however, for nutrients, the initial removal rate was faster for the phosphate um, in the tanks that had algae in them. But at the end of the trial, the same amount of phosphate had been removed. And here is a table summarizing the average percent of each substance um, that was removed in the tanks with and without algae. The second series of studies were the compost studies. And for the first one, uh, the algae from the mesochasms was harvested again. It was separated by the treatment that it had in the tanks, whether it was high metal or no metals added. Um, and each type was then homogenized. 
Um, nine compost bins, like the ones you see in the picture here, were created using compost, vermicompost from the university's bio, uh, biology department. And the compost was already partially through its cycle, but um, it had originally been made from food scraps from the cafeteria and added cardboard and paper scraps as well. So the high metal algae was added to three of the bins. The low metal algae was added to three and three bins served as a control group. Um, and the volume of the algae that was harvested from the tanks was not very much. So um, additional algae was harvested from the stormwater ponds, rinsed, cleaned, and then added to the six algae bins. Um, there was an equal amount of algae in each bin that had algae added as well. The trial was allowed to run for six, sorry, three weeks um, in a climate control chamber. And we also collect, collected leachate uh, by setting the bins at an angle and placing the sample bottom bottles underneath, uh, as you can see here. For this study, it was ultimately concluded that simply not enough algae had been added to the mix. And that's because uh, the results were not very distinguishable between the three treatments. So as you can see here on this graph on the left, while there were generally more metals in the high metal algae bins, the difference wasn't significant enough to draw any conclusions from. So the study was repeated, uh, but this time with a few tweaks to the methodology. Um, this time a greater volume of algae was harvested from four different ponds on campus. Um, it was cleaned again and dried. The samples from each pond as well as the compost inputs were taken before everything was mixed together um, and a drying study was done to determine dry weights so that um, a, mass a mass balance analysis could be completed at the end of the study. Um, the same compost was used, but it was earlier in the breakdown process, so the experiment was allowed to run for five weeks rather than three. And this time, uh, only eight bins were created, four with algae and four without. Um, in the four bins with algae, the same amount was used in each, and it was in even proportion from each of the four stormwater ponds. Um, uh, some water was added to the bins with algae this time because they were slightly drier um, and leachate was collected in the same matter. However, some of the bins did not produce any. The results of this study were interrupted at the time. Uh, so my team had calculated the predicted concentrations of each metal based on the inputs of the compost and we use that to compare to the measured results of the final product and average European Union concentration limits for compost. Um, the US does not currently have any regulations for metal concentrations, which is why we use the EU data instead. Um, and as you can see here for nickel and cadmium, they both came in under the EU limits. However, the measured amount far exceeded the predicted concentration for four out of the five of the metals that we tested for. And the only reason that cadmium didn't was because the concentration was so low. Um, and you can see that based on the scale for each metal is a little bit differently. And to address some of this inconsistency, um, there were a few caveats that happened. <laughs> The first is between collecting and preparing the samples of the final compost and then analyzing them, uh, one of the components of the microwave digester that we were using to break down the samples broke. Um, and by that time, the samples had been diluted with nitric acid and they were sealed in the vessels inside the microwave digester. However, they were parked in there for a few weeks while we waited for the new part to arrive. Um, and then secondly, after waiting for that new part to come in, it was right at the end of the semester um, and we didn't have time to fully analyze them at that point. So they were prepared for an, uh, analysis by diluting them with um, more nitric acid 
and water, I believe. <laughs> but again, they were parked there for a few weeks over winter break uh, before they were finally analyzed. So theoretically, their integrity shouldn't have been compromised. Um, however, I believe that those two things, um, having them just sit for so long, I think that those played into the, cons the inconsistency of these results. Another important thing to note here is that another student group who was focused solely on mercury um, had found little difference in the mercury concentration of the algae and the compost inputs, um, which suggests that it could have been the food waste or the compost that contributed a higher fraction of metals than originally anticipated um, rather than the algae. And before COVID, um, another round of compost studies had been planned to try and hone in on that and um, perhaps identify a compost source that was lower in those initial concentrations, um, as well as a germination study to measure the mass balance of metals in plants fertilized with the compost, um, sort of a final fate. <laughs> uh, however, that may just have to be left now to the next generation. So in summary, based on our results, the algae did prove to be effective at phycoremediating the water. Um, however, based on both the predicted and certainly the measured results of the final compost, it may not be suitable for use according to European Union standards. Um, however, I believe that with some further study and finding just the right process, that algae could still be a viable option for phycoremediation and vermicompost feedstock. And here are some of my references from my background information. And finally, I'd like to acknowledge um, some of my professors, Dr. Malcolm, Dr. Rock, and Dr. Howard, um, who helped a lot for the part of the projects that I was a part of, as well as the other contributors to the overall project. Um, some of the student participants that I worked with, Noah Kraft, Rose Ernst, Amy Pinnock, um, and the rest of the fall 2019 environmental chemistry class at Virginia Wesleyan. I'd like to thank Solitude Lake Management for taking care of the stormwater ponds on campus for us. And finally, our funders, the Virginia Wesleyan University Undergraduate Research Program, um, whose funding thoughtfully provided the broken part from the microwave digester, and the US EPA People, Prosperity, and the Planet Student Design Competition Grant um, that funded the overall project. So thank you to those people. And finally, thank you for everyone who's watching today.